Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I look forward to Sunday morning. Amen. It's good to have you all here. Good to see every smiling face. Could see every frowning one too. <laughs> We're going to see if we can change that this morning. Amen. <sighs> Has it been a good week? Has anybody? Can anybody raise their hand and say, "Yes, it's been a good week." Amen. Come on now. I've had a productive week. I've had a good week. Amen. I'm going to give God thanks for that. Amen. Right. right. All right. I don't have an opening scripture this morning. In fact, yeah, <laughs> sin, right? In fact, I was t joking with Pastor Mueller this morning and with Brother Chase. Thank you. For me. <laughs> uh, I was joking with them this morning how it's very... and. and Many of you can attest to this, too. It's very out of character for me to have, you know, less than 15 or 20 scriptures for a Sunday school lesson. I have three <laughs> this morning. So I, as I was studying and taking notes, this ended up being more of a history lesson, really. And I really, okay, history is not at all boring to me. I love history. I start to dive into why things are the way they are now. What happened back then? What can I learn from about that? How can I apply it today so I don't do the same foolish things? And that's really what the, the, the gist of the lesson is about. And so I really hope that we can enter into this history lesson with that same fervor, that same excitement, and not like it was in high school with a teacher up front, you know, yeah. writing things out on a blackboard and we're in back fallen asleep. Right. So the things we're going to talk about today, they're, they're important. So be attentive. Amen? Amen? All right. We started last week a new, I'm not even going to call it a series. We took a different route than what we had been going on. And we were, we're endeavoring to study the minor prophets. It's a series of books that don't get a lot of attention yeah. from preaching, from teaching. For whatever reason, they just kind of get glossed over. They're like, they're like flyover books, right? When we need them, we might stop and fill up with gas, and then we'll just keep going. But for the most part, we're just kind of looking out the window from 10,000 feet, and oh, that's nice, and then moving right along. We look, we look at the book of Acts, we look at the Gospels, the ministry of Jesus, the writings of Paul, but these Old Testament prophets, you know, well, that was just for the Old Testament times, you know. We're not in active rebellion against God and need to be corrected, right? All right, come on, come on. Right, right. There's a lot of meat in the minor prophets that we need to hear in this day and age, because a lot of the things that Israel did, they're happening again. Yeah. Yep. We see it in this country. We see it all over the world. Yeah. Yep. People don't even realize it because they have no knowledge of it. Yeah. So, before we dive in any deeper, I wonder if we could all pray. Yeah. God's word is anointed. It will accomplish what he sends it forth to do. Amen. Right? But our willingness to accept it Amen. will determine whether or not it accomplishes what he sent it forth to do in yeah. our lives. Yeah. We cannot allow our humanity, our pride to get in the way of yeah. what God wants to do for us. That's right. Amen. That's right. So when the Bible says the people said amen, the king gave this decree and the people said amen. Or Moses said this thing and the people said amen. They were coming into alignment. They were coming into agreement. and They were saying, let it be. What this word is saying, right. let it be in my life, right? right. right. What is the, the Lord's prayer? On earth as it is in heaven. Yep. Let your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Yeah. Right. 
So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for your presence in this place this morning. I thank you for your word and your guidance every single day. I pray that you would have your hand on us to receive your word with gladness this morning. And we give you all thanks in Jesus' name. So, like I said, history lesson this morning. We're going to lay a bit of a foundation. If, if I have time, we're going to jump into a little bit of the book of Hosea this morning. If I don't have time, that's going to be next week's lesson. But before we jump into any of that, I want to lay more of a foundation like we did last week. Last week, we talked about what it means, what is a prophet. And the prophets were sent by God for the purpose of correcting the people. Things are out of alignment in this area, and the prophet was sent to bring them back into alignment to God's will, alignment to God's word. They were sent to fix some things, and they did it in such a way that people couldn't say, oh, I didn't understand that. Prophets were very direct. They didn't pull punches. We talked about Nathan the prophet rebuking David when he sinned with Bathsheba. He very plainly said, you're in the wrong, David, and you need to get it right. That's right. That's right. That is the purpose of a prophet. Now, there are a lot of other things that they, they do. Their, their office is multifaceted, so to speak. But in the Old Testament, that was their purpose. So this week, I want to talk about just some basic information the books of the Bible, why the minor prophets are called the minor prophets. If there's minor prophets, that insinuates that there's probably major prophets. There are. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means. So we have, most of us are familiar with the King James version of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, so on and so forth. And that order of books from Genesis to Revelation is what's called the biblical canon. It's the accepted books that are are inspired by God. And the word Bible literally just means library or a collection of those writings that are inspired by God. So, (coughs) excuse me. The the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, it's not technically called the Bible, it's called the Tanakh. Okay? The reason it's called the Tanakh is because they took the first letters from the three sort of headings of their writings and created the word Tanakh. So they've got the Torah, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim. Okay? Torah, T and and K, Tanakh. So the Torah is simply just the Pentateuch. This is the law. This is what God gave to Moses as instruction for the people when they were coming out of Egypt. It's also history of how they got to where they were. So from Adam through the fall to Abraham, well, to Noah first, through the flood to Abraham calling Israel, you know, out of (laughs) the idolatry that they were in and bringing them up and creating a nation. And then, as I said, the law going forward. So that's the, this is in the Jewish Bible, or Tanakh. They've got that Pentateuch, same as us. They go to the Nevi'im, which is Joshua, Judges, Samuel. They combine the books of 1st and 2nd Kings into one book, simply called the Kings. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And then they have this book called the Book of the Twelve. And this book of the 12 is what we call the minor prophets. Now, in the King James Version, we split this out. We've got 12 prophets. You know, Hosea, Amos, uh, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Jonah, Malachi. I'm not going to name them all. (laughs) Then, um, okay, where was I going? In the Jewish scriptures, they combine all of those into one book, and they believe that it should be read as one book. 
And you're not just, when you're looking at these prophecies and the, the ministries of these prophets, you're not just looking at one of them. You're looking at the totality of it. Yeah. And that's a very, you know, that's a very New Testament thing. You, you don't just pick and choose scripture. You take the whole counsel of God Amen. together. Scripture must interpret scripture, yeah, right? You need, if you're going to be listening to a word from one prophet yeah. and another prophet comes up and you say, well, he's a prophet of God and he's probably a prophet of God, but I don't like what he's saying to me. Yeah. If that's what God is speaking, you need to listen. Yeah. doesn't matter if you don't like the person. doesn't matter if you don't like the personality. If it's a word from God, you need to hear it. You need to fall in line with it. And then they have the Ketuvim, which is Psalms, Proverbs, the, the wisdom literature, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, they've got poetry, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and then the book of First and Second Chronicles are combined into one book of Chronicles. So again, we have split some things up, the Christian Bible, the editors, I suppose, of the King James or even the Geneva Bible, they, they split some things up, and I suppose it's for length, for, you know, the, the scripture addresses. So Acts 2, 38, that was added in later. It, originally, it would have just been, you know, a scroll or a codex, and you would have just read through, and that would have been that. Yeah. Yeah. But for memorization purposes, for ease of finding a thing, yeah. those numbers were added in later so people could it was a little more usable. It's like having an index at the beginning of something. Oh, this is what I'm looking for. There it is, right? <laughs> you, you notice in a lot of Paul's writings and just the New Testament in general, Jesus even does this. They don't say, oh, Moses said in Deuteronomy such and such. They said, no, as it was written, yeah. this, yeah. right? I'm going to pick this up. It's bothering me. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so the Minor Prophets, this book of the Twelve, they are not in chronological order. The order that the canon has them in, you know, Hosea, um, Amos, Micah, whatever the order is, I don't know it off the top of my head, that order is not chronological meaning Hosea was not the first prophet to come up. This one was next. This one was next, yeah. right? There's, there's some study that needs to be done, and, and I am doing my best to do it. It's the timelines. For one, the timelines are confusing because we don't always know the exact dates of when a king reigned. We don't always know the exact dates of when a prophet prophesied or was, was you know, doing his ministry. Yeah, and right. so you have to look at who was king during the time of these prophets. If for Hosea, for example, uh, he talks about Uzziah being king in Judah. Well, okay, Isaiah also talks about the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Yeah. Right? Isaiah and Hosea would have been contemporaries. Their ministries overlapped. And so you can't just say, okay, the book of Isaiah happened, and then the book of Hosea happened, and they were back to back. No, they were, they were overlapping. Mm -hmm. They were happening at the same time. And when you start to get into that, you, you, you have to understand what was happening in the, the king's or to the kings, who were the kings? You know, what was the political environment? Because yeah. Sister Borkacher always says it, religion and, and politics has, in this day and age has been separated and ripped apart, but it's not supposed to be. Yeah. It's supposed to be intertwined because yeah. they do influence and affect each other. Yeah. God has a kingdom. It means there is a king. Yeah. That means there are people in authority under that king. Right. Right. This is politics. And I don't mean that as a slur. <laughs> right. So, the, the chronology, the order of these minor prophets, it can be, it's proving, at least for me, to be a little bit difficult to wrap my head around yeah. when everything was. I'm doing my best, and I'm hoping that I can convey that well 
to you all moving forward, but um, we are not going to look at them in chronological order simply because we don't know the exact dates of when people ministered. So for that reason, we are looking at a different way that these 12 minor prophets are split up. So there's, when, you, when you're reading the Old Testament from the time of Solomon through the coming of Christ, okay, there are three major events that really mark Israel's history. The first one being the, well, I'm going to say four events. The first one being the split of the kingdom. And we're going to talk about that today. The second one being, because that kingdom was split into Judah and Israel, it would have been the carrying away of Israel into the land of Assyria. The third will be the carrying away of Judah into captivity in Babylon. And the fourth is going to be the carrying away of Babylon, we'll say, into Persia, which prompts the Israelites, by and large, to return to Jerusalem and start to rebuild the temple and the walls. This is what we read about in Nehemiah and Ezra and Esther a little bit. So these prophets, these the major and the minor prophets, can all kind of be grouped based on those events. So this is what was taking place, and so this is the prophet we're going to talk about. That's kind of how we're going to group them, I think. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's good information to have. And this is what I want to talk about this morning is this division between the northern and the southern tribes, between Israel and between Judah. Okay. You can read about this all in 2 Kings chapters 11 and 12. I'm not going to go scripture by scripture or anything for fear of people falling asleep on me. But please... This afternoon, Sunday afternoon, we like to go kick back in the recliner, maybe take a nap. Before you take your nap, there's nothing better than falling asleep to the Word of God. <laughs> now, stay awake when you read the Word. But also, the peace you feel when you wake up and there's a Bible on your chest. So 2 Kings 11 and 12, we had King Saul. Saul wasn't a very good king. We had King David. David had some problems, but he was a good king. And we had King Solomon, David's son. Solomon did some good things. He also, in his later years, turned from following after God. And because of this, God took the kingdom away from Solomon or rather from his son, Rehoboam. So there was a promise that God made to David, saying that there will never cease to be someone from your bloodline sitting on the throne. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning someone in the throne, on the throne in Jerusalem. So in order to continue to fulfill that word, because God is not a liar, yeah. mm -hmm. God splits Israel, the kingdom of Israel. And you have the tribe of Judah, and you have, well, Judah and Benjamin follow after Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And then you have the other ten tribes who say, we don't like that guy. Yeah. We don't like that personality. Yeah. We don't like what he's, you know, his campaign message, <laughs> so to speak. Um. So we're just going to go over here do our own thing, anoint our own king. So this is one of these, he's not a, considered a minor prophet. I, I didn't touch on that. Minor prophets and major prophets. Real quick, side trail, I apologize. Minor prophets are called minor prophets not because of their importance. Right, yeah. right, right, right. You've got major league baseball and minor league baseball, and you think major league baseball is the most important. Bless God. <laughs> They're minor prophets because the length of their book, yeah. the length of their prophecy is not as long as the 60 chapters or plus of Isaiah. Right, right. 
It's simply the length of the book. So Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they are major prophets because the, their prophecy, their, their length of their ministry, the writings that they produced are much larger than Jonah, which is four chapters, right? So that's, that's simply what major and minor, the, the distinguishing factor is. So there are still other prophets throughout Scripture. Nathan was one of them that we talked about last week. There's also a prophet, Ahijah, who we're going to talk about today. They're prophets, just the same as the major or the minor prophets, but they don't have a book for themselves. Now, they are recorded in Scripture, most of them. Well, all of them that are recorded in Scripture are recorded in Scripture. (laughs) There were others that we don't know about. When Elisha was ministering, there was a whole college of prophets. Now, whether they were true or false... We're not going to get into that. So, the prophet Ahijah. We're we're back to talking about Solomon and the kingdom being taken away from him and his son. We have this prophet Ahijah, and he, he asks a man named Jeroboam to come and meet him in the field. Jeroboam was a, a mighty man. He was one of the valiant men. And Solomon put him in place over the sons of jo- um, Joseph. And he was, he was an important guy. He was a leader. He was like a captain over an army sort of, yeah. sort of guy. And so he had some authority. He had some pull with Solomon. And Ahijah, this prophet, he takes Jeroboam aside. And he, he has this new garment on. Right, he takes his suit jacket off and he <laughs> rips it down the middle, yeah. and then <laughs> rips it again into twelve pieces. He takes ten of those pieces and he gives them to Jeroboam. He says, "This is to symbolize that God is taking the kingdom away from Solomon and giving a portion of it to you." This is one thing to keep in mind as we study the prophets. There is a lot of symbolism. There is a lot of things that happen in the physical that are indicators of what's happening spiritually. Why is the kingdom being torn? You know, why is he tearing this garment? Because the kingdom is being torn. Why is the kingdom being torn? Because Solomon is in sin. That's a spiritual condition. But it's also a physical one. So he gives ten pieces of this garment meaning 10 tribes of the 12 of Israel. And he gives one or two, I, I, we'll say two, to, Je- or to Rehoboam, Solomon's yeah. son. Yeah. This is the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. So Jeroboam goes away. Solomon hears of this. He threatens to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam flees. Yeah. I would too. <laughs> yeah. Rehoboam, Rehoboam is the one who, he arises to power, and he says, you know, how do I be a king like my father was king? And he goes to the counselors that his father had, and he says, what can I do? And they said, make the burden of the people light, and they will love you, and they will serve you forever. Right? Your father was pretty harsh. Pull a few of those things back and they will be glad to serve you. Well, he makes the mistake, Rehoboam, and he goes to his friends. He says, what should I do? And his friends say, make it worse. Crack the whip on them. They don't want to work, make them work. So that's what he does. And because of that, the people of Israel say, you're crazy. We are not, this is, this is just like Egypt. We're not going back to this. Yeah. Yeah. And so they follow after Jeroboam. Jeroboam says, hey, I'm not going to do that to you. Well, Rehoboam gets mad and brings the tribes of Judah and Benjamin out to war against the tribes of Israel. Yeah. Or the other ten tribes. And God says, 
sit down, you little child. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the split of the kingdom. You have Israel in the north, the kingdom of Israel in the north. The, the capital city is Samaria. And you have the kingdom of Judah in the south, the, king, or the capital being Jerusalem. You have the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the, the genealogy and the kings following after David. And then you have Israel in the north, and you have these rebellion-driven kings. And you see that you, when, you, when you read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Like I said before, it can be a little difficult to keep track of who you're reading about. Because it says, in such and such a year, when such and so and so was king in this place, this was happening in this place, and this was king, and then it goes on to tell about that king. And then you go back and it says, when that king that you were just reading about was king, this person was king over here, and this is what they did. And so, take notes. If you, if, if, if the difference between Bible reading and Bible study is how much you write down. So if you want to study your Bible, start taking notes, especially in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, because I get lost. I have to start writing it down. I have to refer to some timelines. I have to get it straight in my head. I can build you a cabinet. No problem. But when it comes to keeping track of genealogies and things, I shoot from the hip. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I remember that's in there somewhere. <laughs> The kingdom of Israel in the north, king after king after king, is wicked, evil, does not follow after God. They live in complete rebellion to what God is doing. I did find this one. It was really helpful. pastor actually sent it to me. And it had a list of all the kings and which kingdom they reigned over, whether it was the kingdom of Judah in the south or the kingdom of Israel in the north. And one of the things that it had next to their name was whether they were a good king or an evil king when they took the throne and whether they were an evil king or a good king when they left the throne. And the whole side that were kings over Israel started evil and ended evil. And that is what happens when you live in active rebellion against God. No good can come of it. Jeroboam, he had this prophecy put over him that he was going to reign over the kingdom of Israel. But just because God said, I'm going to give this to you, doesn't mean that he did well with it. He was not a good steward of what God gave him. Yeah, yeah. He could have led the people in the law of God, and they could have all turned their hearts to him, and it could have been great, but he didn't. Yeah. And so it wasn't. Yeah. Right. And so I talked about earlier the, the four big overarching events that happen. The second one after the split of the kingdom was the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, into the hands of the nation of Assyria. This happened in roughly 722 BC for anybody who's interested in the dates. I was talking with Pastor Mueller. When we read about Israel going into captivity, a lot of us think of Babylon, the Babylonian captivity. Well, there was also the Assyrian captivity. You've got two kingdoms. You've got two nations that come into each of those kingdoms and take them over. But when Babylon comes into the kingdom of Judah, it's almost, almost 200 years after Israel has already fallen to Assyria. That's a long time. So Israel fall, the northern kingdom of Israel falls to the hands of Assyria. This is what we read about in... Um, I believe it's 2 Kings 17. Pretty sure it's 2 Kings. Might be 1st. 
Either way, it's chapter 17. You'll find it in one of the two. Uh, the king of Assyria, he, he attacks Israel and Samaria, and he brings all the people back to Assyria. Well, then he takes all of these other people that he has conquered, and he brings them to Samaria. Yeah. And those people living in Samaria start to intermix with the people from the rest of the surrounding area, and that's where you get the Samaritan people. Yeah. Right. So when the Jews return, they're at odds with them because they're not true Jews. This is where we get that friction that we see in the New Testament, or the gospel accounts. Hosea, I said we, were, we might talk about him. Uh, he was, his ministry took place right, right before the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. And one of the things that I... <laughs> It really surprised me. You know, you read through the Bible and you get a lot of good stuff, but then you read through it again and you get more good stuff. Right. And then you read through it a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth, seventh, continuing on until you die. <laughs> and you never fail to get good stuff, yeah. right? And you're like, how did I not read that the first 300 times? Right. Right. Where did I miss this? Right? right? It's a living word. God reveals things to you according to, well, he knows what's best. Yeah. And there are some things that if you had the knowledge of it, it might destroy you. And so he waits for the proper time to reveal things to you. Yeah. Until you're mature enough to handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't put my daughter behind the wheel of my pickup and say, there you go. <laughs> You'll need to figure this out someday. Do it now. Yeah. Trial by fire. Right. I sit her on my lap behind the wheel of my pickup. <laughs> and we drive together. That's right. Just in the driveway. <laughs> okay, the thing that I found interesting. Hosea's ministry. The time of Hosea's ministry. Hosea prophesies against the current king over Israel at, the, at that time. And that king dies. Somebody comes in and murders him and takes the throne for themselves. Shortly after that, another person comes up and kills that king and takes the throne for himself. Not too long after that, Another king comes and kills that king and takes the throne for himself. Four kings in the span of one year. And that's something that I didn't realize when I was first reading through it. It's just one after another. A, king is, or a, a guy is coming up and killing the king and taking the throne. I don't like what he's doing. I can do it better. No, yeah. no, nah, nah, he's doing it wrong too. We're going to kill him. Start over. Right. This is that con continuation of, of rebellion. Yeah. Things being out of order. Things being out of alignment to the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody is... It, okay, when you read the book of Judges, the people come into the promised land and they're dwelling there, but they're not living according to the word of God. And so you read through the book of Judges and there's all these terrible atrocities. Like it's, it's horrifying some of the things that happened in the book of Judges. And then Saul comes along and things are brought into a little bit of order. And then David comes along and things are really, really rolling well. Yeah. Solomon comes along and he brings the wealth, but then things start to kind of fall off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> and then Rehoboam happens and they find the, the bottom <laughs> of that ravine. And things start to go back to the way they were in the book of Judges and people are just doing what they want to do. I don't need what God says. I, I can figure this out myself. Wrong. And that's, that's the whole point of this this morning. We, can, we read through these minor prophets. We read through the history of Israel. And we see the, the, the choices that they made. Right? We look back 
and we look at the archaeological record, we look at the history books, we look at the timelines, and we think this is history. This is cool. But all of those things, these events that transpired, only transpired because of the choices that the people of Israel made, whether to follow after God or not. Babylon and Assyria never would have touched Israel had they been living in accordance with the word of God, had they been trusting and following after him. But that's, that's what we consider history. So as we're going forward, we need to realize that the choices that we are making are going to be somebody else's history. Yeah. 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 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 400 years from now, somebody is going to look back and say, the choices that they made got us here. Mm -hmm. So reverse that, and as we look forward, where do we want here to be? Because I, I read through and I read about the things that happened to Israel and to Judah when they went into captivity. Read the book of Lamentations. Read the prophet Jeremiah. I don't want any of that to happen to anybody, especially my family, no matter how many generations down the line it may be. Second right. Timothy 3. 16 and 17. I told you I had three scriptures, and you've all been waiting patiently for them. <laughs> all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? Verse 17. That the man of God, or woman of God, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture. Yes. Yes. Not the prophet that we choose to listen to. Come on. Not the king that we choose to listen to. Come on. Not all scripture. Yeah. We don't live in the book of Acts alone. We bring in the gospels. What does Jesus say? We bring in the New Testament writings of Paul and Peter and John. We bring in the history of the Old Testament and say, let's learn from this. Let's grow. Let's become better people. Let's do the will of God. Romans 15 and 4. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Comfort of the scriptures. We read about Lamentations, we read about Jeremiah, and we think, man, that is, the, that is so far from comforting. <laughs> but it's comforting to have that knowledge and then read that Jesus came and died for sinners. Yeah. Yeah. So that we might have hope, that we might have grace, that we might have mercy if... We repent. Because yeah, right. what does he say? Unless you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. perish. Yep. 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 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, this is Paul, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under... Th I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, this is type and shadow of baptism and infilling of the Holy Ghost, but we'll, that's another Bible study. Verse 2. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3. I'm going to turn there. All ate the same spiritual food, because this is going to take longer than it needs to, unless I turn there. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6, these things became our examples, 
to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. All these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. And so, as we're studying these minor prophets, lest there's anybody who still holds to the idea that they're minor because they're not important, they're important. Everything that they have written is for good, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There's a lot of things... Paul wrote two epistles to Timothy. To Timothy, saying, do this, do this, don't do this, fix this. Now, we could very easily say, well, that was for Timothy. I'm not Timothy, that's not for me. But we don't do that. We take what Paul wrote to Timothy and say, okay, that's good lesson to live by. That's good instruction. I can apply that. It's no different with the minor prophets. It is not written specifically to us, but it is. And we can still take it. We can still apply it. We can still learn from it. We can still live by it. We must. So, as I suspected, I am out of time. (laughs) We did touch a little bit on Hosea, but we are going to dive fully into Hosea next week.